Okay, we're recording. Okay, three, two, one. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 120 of the Security Podcast on the In30 Network. This week, Tom, because I can't do this, is going to give us the history of Linux. Because I, we figure, we talk about Linux all the time. Linux is around us. Everywhere we go, we see Linux op boxes doing different things. And we want you to know it's not dangerous. It's not scary. It may even benefit you in some ways. So I'm going to turn over to Tom, and I will just interject with random quips as I see them fit. So you've probably heard of Linux. And unfortunately, due to the the passing of time, we have lost much of the history behind it and where it came from. But rumor has it that uh, a group of D&D players dressed in wizard's robes and carrying cardboard weapons uh, decided to try to cast one of the spells and brought forth the evil Lunix upon us. Uh, it has now taken over most computers and our impending doom is upon us. All hail Skynet. Well, Skynet's probably running Linux. I, I actually think I, in one of the Terminator films, you can pause it, and on um, one of the messages uh, through the Terminator's eyes, like Linux kernel 4 or something, and we're in the Linux kernel 4 era, so it is only a matter of time. Can we do a dihydrogen monoxide reference? Everyone who did yeah. bad things used Linux? Yes. So, so there you go. So everyone who's ever done something bad including you probably has used some form of Linux on the or operating system. It, uh, it powers the net. So Linux, what is Linux? Linux is an operating system, uh, which, you know, unless, you know, you're probably know what an operating system is if you're listening to this podcast, but in case you don't, it's really the first thing that your computer runs. It's what makes your computer useful. It coordinates programs. It hooks you up to the net uh, it, you know, displays graphics and text. Uh, it is really the most base part of your computer software suite. If you run Windows, any form of Windows or Mac OS uh, or OS X, as it is formerly known now. Uh, formerly you... known. Mac yes. Lowercase m os. Yes. <laughs> lowercase m os os. Then uh, you have used an operating system. I guarantee you everyone has used an operating system. Um, if you're using Android or iOS or if you have a BlackBerry, those also have operating systems on them. Um, so Linux is an operating system, but what makes it special? Um, back forever ago in ancient history in the 1990s, um, there was a, uh, a, a Finnish college student named Linus Torvalds um, who decided to clone one of his favorite operating systems, Minix, uh, which was a clone of Unix. Uh, they weren't directly related. Unix was big and professional and paid in most aspects. We'll get to BSD in a bit. Um, and Minix really took that and made a Unix-like operating system. And then Linus... Uh, took Minix and said, ah, I want to make something kind of like this. He didn't like take the source code and directly re-implement it or, you know, um, copy it word for word or anything like that. He just said, okay, this is kind of the way it works. I'm going to make my own thing uh, that sort of emulates the way this one works. Um, and he put it out in the net and he said, hey, this isn't going to be anything big or professional, uh, but here's my kernel uh, and it's going to run on uh, these cheaper chipsets, uh, and let me know what you think. And apparently, it was very, went very well because all I hear now is, "Do you run Linux?" And the answer is either yes for most people that I deal with, or no, uh, I can't spell it. And then we get the, "Is it Windows? Where's the thing in the corner? Where's the Clippy guy?" So. so it's it's definitely different, but chances are, uh, if you know you have used the internet at all, you have reached out and touched a Linux box or several. Uh, Linux powers most of the net. Uh, it is huge. It's giant, and the reason for that is unlike Windows, where you know, you've got to restart it all the time, it crashes sometimes. It's it's relatively unstable, or at least it's got a history of being relatively unstable. It's gotten better in recent years, but 
you know, there's always the horror stories of Windows machines just failing to start one day uh, for something that's software related. Uh, Linux, on the other hand, has got a rock solid track record of uptime and reliability. Uh, there are Linux machines out there that have been running for years, uh, you know, getting updates and everything else. And you're probably thinking, wait a minute, how do you update if you don't have to, if you're not restarting the computer all the time? Well, in Linux, you can actually update it while it's running, which is really cool. Uh, with the big exception being in many cases, not all cases now, thanks to the 4.0 kernel, uh, in many cases, um, you can update all of Linux uh, except the kernel without restarting at all, which is really cool. Windows can't do that quite yet. Well, I, I wanted to talk about that because a lot of people say, oh, I mean, most people complain when the second Tuesday of the month comes, they get their, their package of updates and they have to now restart their computer. I mean, most people don't mind if the computer restarts while they're sleeping or while they're at work. Clearly not when they're doing mission critical tasks like checking Facebook, but it is it does get really annoying when you have to restart. Now let's take that and let's say you have a server out in the middle of nowhere that's thousands of miles away and you have to issue either a restart command or you have to actually go there and unplug it. Linux doesn't have that problem. It just, you can say, res not even restart, but you can apply the patches and not have to worry. So mission critical tasks don't take hours to, to do. Yeah, it's it's really awesome. So I run Linux on the desktop. Um, I am one of 10 people that do. Uh, I'm sure we'll get some hate mail for that. Um, but, you know, unless I get a kernel update, which is the absolute core of my operating system, I don't restart. Uh, if, if you know, SSH, which is my remote connection manager, uh, gets an update, uh, a security patch, I just restart SSH. It's like shutting down your browser if you have an update and bringing it back up. It's quick. It's relatively painless. Um, and if you really needed to, you could automate it. It could just happen without you really knowing or realizing it. Uh, it's absolutely fantastic. It's the, I mean... It's sometimes annoying when you're in the middle of a uh, browsing session and all the tabs now, something crashes and you have to restart. But that, that's what you're doing. You're updating each individual part. And the, and the good thing is, is that you don't have to worry. You're at work and imagine you're at work and your Nest thermostat gets an update. And it's cold or it's hot. And if it was running Windows or it didn't have this ability to, you needed to do something. Now you come home and it's hot or it's cold because it, restarted in the middle of the day and you weren't there to do whatever hit okay happened to me yesterday i got my june security updates from android and because of security i had to put my pin code in at least a dozen times and i fell asleep before the last time so i woke up this morning with the dreaded updating app one of x number of apps and that's why my alarm clock didn't go off yeah so <laughs> Android is probably a a bad example. Oh, yeah. So Android is based on Linux. Android contains a Linux kernel and a bunch of other stuff that Google made and threw in there. Um, but they, the way Android handles updates is is a, a tale of woe and misery <laughs> woven throughout the ages. Um, most Linux systems, especially Linux servers, um, you know, updating them is easy. It's one command or sometimes in the case of security patches on a system that can handle it, like Debian. We'll get to what Debian is in a minute. Um, we'll just pull the security updates when they feel like it. They'll check a couple times a day saying, hey, is there anything new? And just pull it down and automatically apply it. Now, you don't have to do that. That's an option. You can turn it on if you want to. But that's one of the great things about Linux. If you don't like the way it works, you can easily change it. Well, it's... Uh... It's the, the problem that I run into. So over the years, what have we done? We made the Raspberry Pi VPN. We made the free NAS box. We did uh, the, the router. All these things, because I don't have to watch them, I just forget about them. And that unfortunately can be, a, it's awesome that I don't have to come home and my router is not working. I mean, the last time I did a router reset, I don't remember that. I caused the router reset, I think the last time. And I don't. the problem is that there is a security update. It doesn't, for me at least, I, I guess I didn't set it to automatically check. I have to set a cron job, which is like advanced Linux. 
And but it works on the on the the good news is it works. The bad news is you have to remember that it is just working, and you just have to periodically check up on them. Yeah, which is why Linux is used just about everywhere for embedded systems. So your Nest thermostat it's running Linux. Um, your light bulbs they're probably running Linux. Uh, that security system yeah it's Linux too. So why? Don't people use Windows? Well, there's several reasons. Uh, and uptime in operating system design isn't really the main one. The main reason, it's money. It's always money. That's always the main reason behind most business choices. So Windows, you've got to pay for it. You've got to license it. You've got to take a, a bag of money with a dollar sign on it and hand it to Microsoft and say, please, sir, could I have some operating system? And they ladle you out a spoonful of Windows. And most of the time it's, you know, well now Windows 7 embedded, but before it was, you know, Windows XP and, you know, deal with this for the next 15 years. And you hope it, there aren't huge Windows flaws that'll make your platform insecure. There always are. And even on Linux, well, Linux is not immune to security vulnerabilities, but it's a lot easier to move to the next version than Microsoft makes it. Um, so with Linux, it's a little bit more battle hardened because it was designed for the net. Uh, it doesn't have a bunch of legacy cruft laying around that you know the Linux developers have to keep moving and keep working uh, because you know old, older systems need it. They can yank stuff out when they want to get rid of it. They can update components and say, hey, this is a breaking change. Make sure you fix it because it's a vulnerability. Um, so it's, it's battle hardened and free. You don't have to pay a dime for most versions of Linux. And that's the thing. There's many different versions called distributions, different flavors of Linux. You want one that's built for the desktop and built for ease of use and make it so, you know, the computer illiterate person can use it and not get themselves into trouble, not deal with viruses, not deal with having to update manually, just have it all taken care of for them so they can browse Facebook and that's it. There's a Linux distribution out there for you. You know, go ahead and run Linux Mint or Ubuntu. They're perfect for that. Chrome OS. Chrome OS. Also Linux. Uh, if you want something where you can tweak and tune every little piece of the system, make it work exactly the way you want to, and make sure that there's no software in there that you didn't put there yourself, well... Go ahead and have Arch Linux or Gen 2. Let's say you want something with a little bit more enterprise vibe. You, you want the ability to pay someone for support uh, if you get into trouble. Well, here's Red Hat. Here's Suze. You can pay both those guys. Um, if you want something with an enterprise twist to it, but you don't want to pay for it, CentOS. That works perfect, too. Uh, so depending on what you want, depending on what you're looking for, there's a Linux distri distribution out there that will fit your needs just about perfectly. And if you're crazy and you don't care about support, you could roll your own if you absolutely wanted to. But just a secret, no one does that. Everyone just takes Debian and makes something out of it. I was going to say, just my dad always said, you want the new version of Windows, buy a new computer. Because the Dells and the HPs of the world license Windows at a super cheap rate. So you could buy a $350. The actual cost of Windows 10 is probably close to $400. Nobody ever pays $400. They buy a mouse and they get the OEM developer kit because you're going to build a computer with that shiny mouse you just bought. You pay $100 for that. So you're paying $100. A brand new computer from Dell on the really low end is like 300 bucks. Or you go on Woot or you go on one of these daily deal sites and you can find a licensed copy of Windows for next to nothing, $150. Now, it's licensed to that machine and everything else. But imagine paying a small fortune to put Windows on. Let's say $100 just for the starting cost or $50 for the starting cost. Everything is going to go up $50. And remember, Microsoft probably needs, Windows probably needs at least 512 megs of RAM instead of probably 256 for a lot of the little things. So that's added cost and more storage space and all that stuff adds up, even though you're paying pennies for it, it still adds up. Yeah. And especially with the obsession with putting everything in the cloud, let's, let's put everything on a server in someone else's data center. Let's make a billion servers appear out of virtually nowhere uh, and let's pay for it. Well, you can, 
in AWS and Rackspace, you can go ahead and buy Windows servers. Now, they're going to have to be beefier because Windows takes a lot more resources to run and you're paying that license cost for every single server. Let's say you just want to host a couple web pages, right? Do you want to really pay the 15, 20 bucks a month to stand up a, uh, a Windows server? No, get the cheapest thing you can, five bucks a month and put some web pages on it because Linux doesn't cost you money. Now, that said, there's no one you can really call if you have an issue with most free Linux distributions. The help kind of comes at your own expense, which is time. You can go and Google a problem. You can ask on forums. You can jump into chat rooms. There's a lot of places to get the help, but there's no big central authority that you can, you can call someone up and say, dear Microsoft or HP or Dell, I'm having this problem with Linux. They're going to say, yeah, we don't really care. Dell does sell Linux machines, but they're probably not going to help you with them. Whereas Microsoft with Windows, you can go to Best Buy or any local computer shop. Everyone knows Windows and just about every tech can get around it and try to fix some things that you would have wrong with it. Uh, in the absolute worst case, you can reinstall it for you. Uh, but with, with Linux, it's definitely, it's free, but you trade away some time to be able to use it. Look, it's the... <clears throat> It's the whole idea is if you have a problem, there's somewhere to call. Somebody will know. The kid down the street knows Windows really well. So there's always somebody to do it. But if you're that type of person who doesn't want to pay for Microsoft support and you're finding the, the answer online anyway, why are you paying for it? I mean, you're paying for the support. You're paying for, I guess, the ubiquity. The uh, ubiquity is the wrong word. For the fact that everyone has it and that you can call some somebody you can sit at any machine and say oh i understand this imagine if i put a linux machine in front of you and i didn't tell you it would take you at least 10 minutes to realize something was wrong yeah it's it's definitely a trade-off um that said you don't have to go full in you don't have to throw away all your computers and buy new linux machines linux will work just about everywhere um so if you want to try it out you can go and pull down what's called a live CD. You download a file, you double click it, and it writes it to a disk, uh, a CD, and you boot your machine from CD-ROM, and it'll come up and it'll be Linux. It'll be great. Uh, and, and if you want to away, if you want to get back, just shut your machine down, take out the disk, and you're done. You're, you're back to Windows. Uh, it only exists on the CD. It doesn't actually write anything unless you tell it to onto your hard disk. It won't erase anything unless you tell it to. Um, but if you want to install it, you can, you have that option. Uh, some distributions let you install it side by side. So you've got Windows over here and Linux over here and it'll come up with a nice menu and say, you know, where do you want to go today? And you just select a boot time, whether you want Windows or Linux. A lot of people do that for gaming on Windows and then everything else they have to do on Linux. And it's generally safer to not run Windows all the time. And you look, people on Mac do it. You boot camp into your Windows install so you can do other things or you or you can boot you can use boot camp for anything else. I don't particularly so Tom runs Linux as his main machine. That's it. Because you know what? Tom Tom knows, he reads any sort of problem he has. He'll figure it out. Moving between moving between the operating systems is not a big deal. So if you start getting flexible where things should go, moving between op OSs, not a big deal. You know that there's some sort of application list. You just have to find it. You know that there's some sort of browser. You just have to find it. But if you're the type of person that needs everything in the same spot all the time, maybe Windows is the right answer. But if you can move away from that and understand how a computer works, you'd be happy with Linux. And it's not such a huge deal today because we have a multitude of computing devices, right? We've got iPads and iPhones. We've got Android devices. We have uh, Chromebooks. And if you've right. used anything other than a Windows PC, you understand the, the fundamental shift your head has to make to say, okay, I'm not in my same computing environment. I have to work a little bit differently here if I'm using this device compared to my Windows machine. With Linux, you just make that same paradigm shift and you can get around it. Now it is different. It will take some time. You're not gonna be a Linux expert overnight, but it's really nice. You start to, you start to see 
the design choices between Windows and Linux on how they do things and why they do things. And, you know, you might prefer things one way or another. Um, I know for me, I absolutely abhor using Windows most of the time today because I just, I don't like the way it feels. I don't like the way it operates. I really, really like my Debian systems. They're clean, they're fast, they do what I want them to, and they don't do anything more than what I tell them to. Uh, and I don't have to worry about it. It just keeps running. Um, on Windows, it kind of feels like I'm wearing handcuffs or I'm wearing mittens and trying to do something. Uh, it's really restricting. Um, but, you know, it's it's a personal preference thing, and I highly suggest you take the time and try it. Let me ask you, how do you feel on OS X? Um, I feel the same way about you know, handcuffs and mittens. I, I tried, so uh, the place of business uh, where my day job is um, has provided really nice, I mean, they did not skimp at all. Super nice, top of the line MacBook Pros for the team. Awesome, fantastic, right? We're, we're Linux guys, we're Unix guys. We need something that's, you know, got a good shell on it. Um, and this is way before Windows 10, so they got us all Macs. I tried. I really tried my hardest to love OS X, uh, but I I couldn't. It was painful for me. I wanted to do things a certain way. I wanted the machine to work a certain way. I wanted it to operate the way I told it to, but that's not how you use a Mac. You, you basically sit in the seat and you let the Mac guide you, and you do everything the way Apple wants you to do. And if you go outside of that box, they will slap you down so fast it's not even funny. I don't like my computers to operate that way. So I did what any Linux guy would do, and I wiped it and I put Debian on it. So my Mac runs Debian now. So now you have awesome hardware with Debian. Yes. So, but if you start looking at a computer as a one use device machine, you could start saying, I have all these options for whatever I want to do. So if you're using a laptop just to browse on the computer, Chrome OS. Chrome OS works awesome. Okay. Now, if it starts, well, I want to sync this and I want to photo edit. Well, now it becomes something else. Now you need something that will handle that. And the, the big problem with these alternate operating systems is that the, the manufacturers don't want to support them. Adobe, fin- does Adobe have Photoshop for Linux? They may at this point. I don't think so. I mean, there's, I think they've got web versions out. I don't know how good those are. I haven't used Photoshop in forever, but, you know. Um, you know, with the majority of people's applications being something web-based and something in the browser, you're good. I, I'm running Chrome right now, and it Chrome runs everything on Linux as it does on Windows or the Mac. Uh, it's just Chrome. I mean, you start looking, and but I urge you to figure out what do you actually use on a daily basis or on a weekly basis that a Chromebook or something that's alternative that runs, that's just the browser, can't do. There's iTunes, if you still use iTunes, but I think even Apple's moving away from there. Um, There's, I'm looking at Skype, but Skype is now on Linux. Skype is everywhere. Well, Skype for Linux is a, a sore point. So Skype was on Linux, and then Microsoft bought Skype, and it's been version locked at that old version forever, and if you have a live account, a Microsoft account that you use to sign into Skype, it will not work on Linux today. Uh, it is it is just about completely worthless right now. So there are Skype plugins that you can use if you use just the text message chat function. But yeah, there's there's really no Skype for Linux today, at least nothing that's worthwhile. But I mean, most people now are using FaceTime or they're using Hangouts. There's other ways to get people to video chat with you, which is... Which is a good thing. I mean, yeah, Skype came out first with video chat, but look, we're using Blab. You can send someone a Blab and it's online and it works really well. If I, I set up my, uh, what's it called? My my server. Now I could have put Ubuntu on. I could have put, micro, I had before this a Microsoft version, a uh, home server that they just never iterated with. It was awesome, but they never iterated with it. And at some point I had to move. The hardware was getting old. And I said, what could I do? And then I learned the the benefits of a ZFS file system, which is way too complicated to explain. But basically, that's the thing you want on a server. 
Then I got tired of rebooting my router. And someone said, well, you should try, I'm forgetting it, PF PF Sense. Okay, so here you have certain distributions for certain things that make the job work way better. And it's if it works better on this, it's single, yes, it's single use and you can't do something else with it. But if it works well for this, why why do you want to ruin it by having it do so many different things? Windows is that general purpose thing. It's good for everyone, but then people are familiar with it. So what do they do? They stick it on your ATMs. They stick it on your on your entertainment systems. And they crash. Somebody once said, why can't the car run this operating system? And the answer is, and I didn't think of this, the problem with the car is that it has to work 100% of the time. You can't have the gas pedal not work on the middle of the road. It has to be bulletproof. So when it works, it has to work. And it can't fail. It can't reboot in the middle. So they've designed their own clunky systems to make sure that works. And I, I am going to steal a joke from Swift on security. The reason cars don't run Linux is because Linux has driver problems. <laughs> but uh, I, I do have to I do have to make a slight correction. Uh, FreeNAS and PFSense are both um, Unix. Yes, they are both Unix. They are both BSD specifically, FreeBSD more specifically. Uh, they're FreeBSD with some stuff layered on top, um, and I love them both dearly. Um, FreeBSD is different than Linux, um, and I'm sure we'll have time in the next episode to discuss some some BSD stuff uh, because it is different. It is completely different from Linux. Uh, they're both part of the Unix-like family, um, but uh, you know, Linux is definitely more prevalent. It's more popular, and it runs more things today. Uh, and there are historical reasons for why that's the case, um, but. If you have something single purpose, if you have something um, that you need uptime, you need reliability, you know, choosing Linux over Windows uh, is a great idea. Uh, if you value not paying licensing fees, Linux is a fantastic choice, as is uh, as are all the free operating systems, uh, from BSD to Linux to Open Solaris. Um, you know, take your pick, uh, but. We, we haven't really discussed one of the, the bigger security um, benefits of using Linux, which is you are now immune to all of those nasty Windows viruses because they just don't run. They're built for Windows, they run on Windows, and they won't run on Linux. Well, you're immune because of the market share, which yes. I always like to tell Mac people. Mac people say, oh, we don't get viruses. No, you do. You're just immune because no one's going to write it for one percent of the population when 99 percent when there's enough stupid people that make up more than 50 percent of the population on windows yeah it's it's like we always tell you you know make the target on your back smaller well the people who use windows that's the majority of people so where are people aiming for the biggest target and that's why linux or windows has got the majority of the malware out there with linux i mean you're talking what one, maybe 2% of desktop home users are running Linux. Maybe not even that high. I think it hasn't even broken 1%. But you know, that's a way smaller target. Uh, so you don't have to worry as much. Now, that's not saying that you can go to phishing sites and throw in all your passwords and say, oh, I'm immune to everything. That's not the way that works. But you know, when it comes to just standard malware, drive-by downloads, stuff like that, you are going to be more immune than someone running Windows. Absolutely. And that's, and so, well, look, to leave you with this, because we always tell you don't run as an administrator. We tell you all we're doing is we're telling you how to lock things down. The good part with Linux is that they realize this and they don't let you run as a, as an administrator, but as a, they let you run as a user. And when they build these protections in the protections are there to benefit everybody. And if you're learning how to do this and you're going to the forums and you're reading, you're going to see why. So, I just wanted to look. I always, you ever notice this? Your TV, your TV, your TV box. So the box you use to watch your TV with, the cable box. All of those are running Linux. Why? Because the last thing people want is in the middle of their show to get a reboot. I get a really big, nasty reboot in the middle or at the last five minutes of Game of Thrones, and now you have everything except for the last five minutes, and you're gonna, you're saying, what's going on? Imagine if something had to update then. It's there and it has a data protection because the last thing you also want to have is a completely wasted drive where all your shows are dead. So at least 
at least the boxes, as much as you hate your cable boxes, they actually did do the right thing. And it may have been because they didn't want to pay for it, but at least they did it. So I am going to leave our, our listeners with this. Uh, and I do have to recommend this distribution uh, over any other right now because it is just so awesomely easy uh, to get started with. Um, I'm going to recommend Ubuntu for first-time Linux users. Um, so that's uh, U-B-U-N-T-U dot com. You can go there. You can download it. It's all free. Uh, and you can pull a live CD. You can even make a live USB if you wanted to and boot your computer from it, try it out, uh, see how you like it. Um, and if you do, they make it easier, easy to switch or install it side by side along Windows. Um, for you know, people who are new to Linux, Ubuntu will hold your hand through every step of the way. Their documentation is fantastic. Their community is friendly. Um, and they've got a Stack Overflow-like site uh, that you can ask questions and get answers to things. Um, and if you Google something and any Ubuntu problem you run across, you're going to get tons of results with people that have found that same problem and solved it. So go ahead and give it a, a give it a try. It is actually way easier than you might think. Um, I know several people who uh, I've converted to, to uh, Ubuntu and they like it better than Windows. It's a lot simpler and faster generally. So, okay then. With that, we're going to leave everyone. Ask us your questions. Leave us your questions. We'll try and answer them next week, and we will see everyone again next week. Bye. Have fun.